It is a huge honor for me. Sorry I lost my voice. I've been lecturing two days in South Africa to be interviewed, podcast interviewing the man, Dr. Nas from the Ukraine. You have exploded all over dentistry. I mean, I hear you see you lecturing in Saudi Arabia, all over. Um, tell us, tell them you're, it's cosmetic dentistry, minimally invasive, microscope. T- tell us, tell us what you're, uh, why everyone around the world wants to hear Dr. Nas. Well, well, first of all, thank you for good words. Actually, yeah, really, during the last four or five years, I've been to 42 countries. 42 so yes, countries. 42, so traveling a lot all the time. I've been several times to the States lecturing. And uh, uh, what are we trying to do, like the new stuff? We're trying to use microinvasive dentistry in our daily practice, not to make it too special, that just to make it like a routine work. So using with, like using magnification, the microscopes, the loops, in the daily practice, not showing that it's some fashionable stuff. But this is actually equipment that simplifies our daily life. This is the point. And of course, when you're using the proper equipment, when you're doing the proper protocols, you raise the quality of your clinical cases. And uh, to prove that it works, we actually document everything. So this is what we show people and this is what people like. Because people don't like just when somebody's showing off. They like when the dentists are showing the cases that are repeatable in their daily practice. So this is one, this is why they come to our courses. They look how how we work. They try it home, it works in their homes, then they come back again to learn more and more and more. So this is how it spreads all over the world. So you're a big proponent of magnification. Yes. And, and um, so do you wear loops? Do you use a microscope? What, what, do, you, what do you be uh, mostly? Well, actually I'm using microscope for the last seven years and I've never used loops. So basically some procedures that people typically try doing with the loops, I never even tried because I just never had them. So I started with a microscope, and to be honest, I don't re- regret because it's actually, it's really, first of all, it's really comfortable for me as a clinician because I don't have a back pain. I can work the full days. I can work the whole week, and I'm not going home, like, soaring with my pain back, you know, like, and I'm enjoying my work. It's like doing a hobby and getting paid for doing a hobby, you know, this is the point. And this is the one side of the microscope usage, and another side is uh, you actually, of course, you raise the quality of the treatment because you see the two that is 22 times bigger. I mean, like you open the whole new world in dentistry for yourself. Like even for the person who is doing dentistry for the last like 20, 30 years, it's like something totally new. So it's like fresh breath in your profession. So are you, what microscope do you use? What, what brand name? Well, I'm using Zeiss. It's from Carl Zeiss company, Zeiss German. Pico, yeah. And, and you use the magnification of 22x? Well, 22 is like maximum magnification. The average one that I'm using is 1012 usually. So with the 22, we check the final precision of the restorations. Uh, we check like um, the fit of the restorations. We check the final details of the margin and all the other stuff. Because you know how we say? We say, less you see, better you sleep. But we realize, <laughs> you know, that... <laughs> You know, I had some doctors coming over to me after the course and they were saying, you know, Nazari, maybe it's too late for me to use the microscope and I probably I will not use it. But I will tell you for sure, if I need a treatment, I will come to you. So people believe in this. This is the most important. So do you roll it into the operatory or do you mount it on the ceiling or is it behind you at 12 o'clock? Well, actually, now I would advise that you can mount it on the ceiling. So in this case, you save space. Uh, actually, I have mine moving, moving around. Why? Because when we got the first one in the clinic, we thought that maybe we will share it with the other doctors. So, like, if somebody has like difficult clinical cases, we'll we will give them the microscope. But believe me, once you start using the microscope, you're not sharing it. It's just yours, and you're gonna fight for it. So, so would you agree that right now in 2016, like when I talk, so probably 83 percent of the guys you're talking to are Americans. And the other 20, 17% are from 100 and what, 42 countries? 220. They, um, <laughs> when they think of a microscope, it's usually an endodontist. But yes. you're not using this just for root canals. You're using this no. for... What, what I would like to say to my colleagues, that first of all, don't be afraid of the microscope because this is not a tool that complicates your life. This is the tool that simplifies it. This is the first rule. Another rule is the microscope is not endodontic tool. The microscope is actually a magnification. I don't know, you can put your signature on a check with a microscope if you want. I mean, this is just the tool that lets you see all the details much better. This is the point. So you can basically use it for the direct, indirect, for the prosto, for whatever. I mean, we always give a very simple example. Imagine, take the best hygienist that you have in USA. 
and ask him to do a hygiene as professional as he or she can do it. After that, take the microscope and check it. And believe me, the person will be really disappointed because you will see how many things you could have missed, but not because you're a bad professional or something, but because you have some limits of the vision. This is the point. And with the microscope, you're breaking the limits. You can do everything in a really good level. So you're a prosthodontist? Yes. And what, what do you mean when you say that you're focused on micro-invasive cases and aesthetic upgrades? Well, it's actually what I like the most, to do like ultra-thin veneers. We are, make, we are doing many clinical cases when we don't prep teeth at all. So we have like additional veneers with a thickness 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters. Because my father is a dental technician. He is an oral design member. And um, he's doing veneers really, really ultra-thin. So if I'm using the microscope in my daily practice, it's very important that my dental technician is also using the microscope in his technical lab because otherwise it will turn out just like my hobby because I will do a precise preparations but the final restorations will not be so precise and I will be disappointed. So this is why you must work as a team with your dental technician. You work you're using that microscope and magnification and he is also using. And so I know that for example American people are always using for the are always looking for the things to simplify their work. And uh, when they hear about microscope the first time, it might be scary, like, oh my God, I mean, it's gonna take like a long time. I agree with you, at the beginning, yes. But after, you will be like, I don't know how I was working without it all the time. Because after that, you will do all the procedures much faster and with the way better quality, this is the point. And you will never regret, believe me. So in America, um, in the 30 years I've been at Dennis, 30 years ago, it was all lab. And then it started making a big swing towards CAD CAM. And some people think that um, it's all going digital. And some people think it's going towards back lab. You're a process. You do really high-end cases. Like when you do ultra-thin veneers, are you doing these with CAD CAM? Are you doing these in a lab? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on CAD CAM? Well, uh, the position is, my position is, and not only mine, but many guys who are doing really nice quality work in the world, that nowadays if you want to have a top level of dentistry, it's handmade. Of course, all the dentistry is moving to the side of digital world. And I agree. I'm sure that in the near future, I will be using a lot more of the scanners. I will use a lot more of the CAT CAM machines. But once you have a connection, good connection, dental technician and a good clinician, then you will have a really great final results because the veneer 0.1, they are not just uh, milled or something. They are being layered. So in 0 0.1 millimeter, you might have already different stains, you might have different ceramics and different visual effects. This is the point. And this cannot be done with the machine. Only the human that sees the teeth, that sees the color, can actually accomplish this kind of treatment. And I, yeah, I agree. Um, when you're doing high-end cosmetic cases, are you ever unraveling some of these teeth with um, ortho or Invisalign or clear retainers? <laughs> Are you doing more traditional with veneers? Well, well, actually, right now, you're saying very proper things because when we speak about minimally invasive dentistry, it's really good to combine the orthodontic treatment with uh, indirect restorations to the ultra-thin veneers. Of course, I can accomplish the case without ortho, but in that case, I need to prep teeth way more, as you realize. And uh, my philosophy is to treat people the way how I would like to treat myself. So for myself, I would like to go for ortho if possible, of course, if there are no limits about this, then I go ahead and do veneers. If, I'm, if, if we are speaking right now about like aesthetic case and, and stuff like this. Of course, not all the people agree for the ortho because some people say that we want to have results now and not, we don't want to wait like two years. And it's also their choice. We cannot say that that treatment is incorrect. This is also correct treatment, but of course it's way better if we add ortho. So you've, le you've lectured in 42 countries, which is amazing. That is amazing. Um, some countries in the Middle East, the United States, want just toilet bowl, kitchen sink white. And other countries like more natural. I wish you would list the countries that want toilet bowl, you know, kitchen sink, porcelain white. And which ones think, ah, that's too American. Uh, because a lot of people say that that's only Hollywood. Only Americans like that bleach white. But I talk to a lot of dentists. Some dentists say in the Middle East, it's common too. And then, and then in some countries, they like it more natural. What, what countries do you think like toilet bowl white, 
kitchen sink and what other ones like him darker? Well, you know, first of all, I would like to say like my country view about all the stuff. Like I prefer to have like natural teeth, to have a night fresh, like nice, fresh light, but natural looking teeth. Because in that case, for me as a clinician, I consider the case successful. But on another hand, I also understand people who are paying sometimes not little money for the treatment and uh, they want to have the teeth that are really, really white. I mean, they can have a choice because they are actually paying for the treatment. And we cannot say that this is improper treatment because we have two goals for the treatment. First one is uh, the health of the human. So we can have a good, healthy retreatment or treatment even with the white teeth. And on another hand, we have the aesthetics. Of course, aesthetics is different for pe different people. Some people like it more natural. Some people think it's too yellow. Other people like it too bright. So, of course, USA is quite popular market for the bright teeth because I think on some hand, uh, nowadays, the smile represent also the status of the person. I mean, like, you know, like buying a nice Porsche. Like, so the person shows that it can allow to buy a nice car. So the same story is about the teeth because we know that in some countries, it's not uh, too cheap to make a beautiful smile. So that's why people want to show that they are, afford themselves to have a nice and beautiful smile. So I, you know, I wouldn't be too, um, too strict about this or other decision. I think people can decide what they like more. I mean, me personally, I prefer to have like nice, natural, bright teeth. But if people choose the white ones, sometimes I do those cases also. But besides the United States, what other countries do you think like um, really white? Well, actually, yeah, now Dubai, they Dubai. like a lot the bright teeth also. Now I travel a lot to Saudi Arabia, beautiful country. Also, some of the patients, they prefer this kind because I'm also communicating a lot with the other dentists. So they are telling me what the patients usually request, how they communicate with them. I think it's getting more and more popular everywhere. If you take Europe, of course, during the last... 10, 15 years in Europe was more like natural smile design, but even in Europe now it's coming more and more white teeth. So it's is, is that because they're watching too many movies from Hollywood? Probably, probably everybody wants to become Angelina Jolie or something like this, you know. <laughs> so what? So um, 2016. What, what what are you passionate about now? What's got you excited now at 2016? What what what, what, what gets you excited now? Well, first of all, I uh, I'm very excited because I met the founder of Dental Town. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, one, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, of course. And um, I'm traveling a lot. You know, this is why I like my my work because it allows me to see the world, different countries of the world. Because probably the countries that I would never go by myself. This is the point. Because I meet so many nice and cool people, and new friends. I learn a lot. I'm not just teaching dentistry, but I'm also learning from other people how they live, how they see the world. And this is a really great world experience for myself in my life, let's say it this way. Also, this year I'm planning to reduce a little bit the traveling because I want to do more clinical cases in my uh, clinic because I have some new ideas. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use now some new materials on the market. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you right now because it's going to be like a surprise for the next year. Now we're also implementing lots of video materials. So now all the cases, we have a video team that's videotaping everything. Also, we are switching wow. totally to the 4K, so we're not doing full HD anymore. So all the videos that we are producing now is the 4K, so really nice, high-definition material, let's say it this way. So I think it will be very interesting to see for our colleagues from Denal Town and from around the world. Wow. So would you, um, um, like in the United States, there are 7,500 labs. You're talking to a lot of dentists. Um, if they want to do a high-end cosmetic case, how do they? How, what, what would you recommend? How would they find a lab to do more high-end cases? I think it's not even about finding the lab; it's about finding the person. Because what I can tell you, you can have a beautiful clinic or you can have a beautiful lab with investment of millions and millions of dollars, but if people who work there are not really motivated, it will not bring you a success. On another hand, you can cooperate with a person that working alone or something like this but who is really motivated to produce a high quality product. And believe me, you will have a beautiful result with that person. So I advise you not to look for the company, but look for the people because people actually create a company. Well said. So what else has got you excited? What, 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 uh, besides dental down. <laughs> no, no, what, 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 um, so, so let, let's, let's talk about some, um, the most difficult case. On Dental Town, they've, they've posted four million times. Nice. When I go to cosmetic dentistry and I see the things that stress them out the most, I think the most stressful thing is a woman, attractive, mm -hmm. high lip line, 
she breaks off one tooth. So you're like, you saw my cases or what? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what do you, what do you do when you have to crown one tooth? That's when I have a great benefit because I'm cooperating with a really good dental technician. So like for us to perform one tooth is not a really big problem. So my father is a uh, really high level so he can copy easily naturally like the opposite tooth. We have plenty of those cases. So we are not doing like, you know, sometimes patients come and they say, you know, I broke the central incisor and I have been to some other clinics and they were saying that we need to, to fix two teeth because one will be visible. We're not trying to follow this philosophy. Usually my father manages to fix one tooth that looks like kind of invisible, let's say it this way. So if, of course, from this point of view, you need a very nice dental technician and not CAD CAM machine will help you. Yeah, a CAD CAM where you're just gonna mill out a monolithic block yes. on a single front tooth. Why do so many people believe that that's just gonna happen? You know, it's like saying, how can I, you pay money for a new tooth? So it's supposed to be more wide than the others, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is. I mean, I mean, you know, nowadays dentistry is a lot about marketing. I agree that the marketing is good, like promoting your stuff to the patients, but you have to have a nice balance between the quality dentistry and marketing of your dentistry. This is the point. Not market very, not to push too hard to market a low quality stuff, and also not to do a high quality stuff, but not marketing. Because, you know, if we take a success in dentistry, probably I can split it in three big parts. The first part would be like a science. I mean, how good you are as a clinician. But what's interesting, nowadays, there are many good clinicians who don't have many patients. Why? Because there is another big part that is important, it's actually the human behavior. And there are, on the other hand, there are people who are very good talkers, way less good clinicians, but they have way more patients. This is the point. So I think either of the sides is incorrect. You should be a good clinician, but also you should be able to promote what you're doing. I think in th this is the best way. And when you're doing both things good, then you're getting financially successful. And then there is the third thing. You must know how to invest those finances to grow with your practice. If you don't know how to do this, you're looking for someone. I'm always giving a very nice example, my family. My father is a dental technician. He is a person of artist, yes, you know. But if you ask him how much is his veneer, he probably doesn't know. You know, but my mom knows. This is the point. I mean, so this is... He met the right person, this is the point. So either you learn how to invest or you find someone who helps you with organization of the practice and all the other stuff. So do, what procedure do you do? Do you also do root canals, extractions, dentures, partials, place implants, or what, what, what is your mix? Uh, wh when I was starting, when I was not traveling, like doing courses and stuff, I was doing differently. I was, I was doing different stuff. I was doing like a mixed dentistry. So it was direct, indirect. I was doing endo treatment also uh, those days. Uh, but nowadays we have a clinic with the three dental chairs and the three microscopes. So every professional in the clinic is working with the microscope. So we have the whole, whole workflow, starting from the hygiene, finishing with the surgery that is being done with the magnification. Because one more time, it increases the quality of the treatment. But this is why when I started traveling, I understood that if I want to do something good, I need to reduce the field of my work. So I chose to do indirect restorations, of course, because my father is a dental technician. So I started to improve in this field. So reading lots of books, that's very important because, you know, there is so much material online that people are not using that is just crazy, to be honest. I mean, you can learn many things like going to dental town, for example. Like, even if you read all the cases, you will already have a big pack of information in your head that you can use for your daily work. This is the point. So I think the biggest enemy of every single dentist is actually the laziness. They are too lazy. This is the point. They don't have to look for the other excuses like the geography, the size of the clinic, uh, difference in the lab technician. It's all inside yourself. Once you turn on your brain, you can be successful wherever you are, whatever you do. Some dentists um, get nervous about bonding on all porcelain crown because mm -hmm. they think the bonding agent irritates the pulp. And a lot of dentists believe that if you bond on a crown, instead of cement the crown, mm -hmm. then you might 10 years later have a higher rate of teeth that needed endodontic therapy. What would you say to that? Well, first of all, I would like to recommend not to listen to the rumors, but to refer to the literature because there is evidence-based information online that everybody can look, everybody can Google. This is the era of Google. You know, nowadays patients come and they know a lot about dentistry. They know about the occlusal concepts. They know about different kinds of materials. So of course, dentists are supposed to do the same stuff. Don't believe to rumors and don't just listen to what the other people are saying. Go online, look for the articles, 
read the articles, and then you will understand what is the truth. Because otherwise, the dentist can be really easily manipulated by other people. Because somebody can say, you know, like, Emacs is a bad restoration because you're going to have a pulpitis or something like this, or some other problems. See, we have some international friends who also want to have a podcast with the dental town. Wait for your turn, guys. <laughs> and so what I'm trying to say, th those are all rumors. I'm using the adhesive dentistry every single day, and believe me, it works perfectly because uh, the biomechanical features of the tooth can be easily restored with the ceramic restorations using the proper adhesive protocol. I want to ask you another question. Um, humans tend to be extremists, all or none. Um, you have a beautiful woman. She lost her front tooth. Yes. Um, it's extracted. Some people say, I don't believe in bridges. I would only do an implant. Some people say, well, I'm more concerned about cosmetics, and I could do a more predictable cosmetic procedure with a three and a bridge and a fourth single crown. What do you do when, I mean, I'm sure if a short, fat, bald guy like me came in, you just make me a removable flipper. But if a really beautiful denture. woman, a denture, if a really beautiful woman came in and she had a high lip line and she really only wanted beauty and aesthetics, do you only do implants? Do you sometimes do three unit bridges? Is there room for both or is it all or none for you? I mean, for this particular case that you are saying right now, I would go for sure for the implant. But if you are speaking about me specifically, if we speak about generally about dentists, what I would say, do whatever you do good. This is the point. Don't start doing things that you're not able to do. If you're good with the bridges, of course we cannot say that it's like black magic or something like this, you know, when you're doing a bridge or something. You can do it. In the past, when I was not doing implants, I was doing many bridges in my office. They still are working. But of course, if there is a chance to have a single implant and you have quite enough of knowledge and you have other specialists who can help you to accomplish the case this way, I would do it like this because this is the way how I would like to be treated myself. This is the point. But would you agree that it's a lot harder to do a single implant on, on a single incisor on a beautiful girl with a high lip line than a bridge? Would you say that's a higher skill set? Well, you know, the, just a the question is, set? what are, what are the aesthetic requests of the patient? I mean, uh, if the girl is so beautiful, you know, she will not really agree to have a bridge, because the beautiful girl ha wants to have all the teeth separately. She wants to use the flaws between each single tooth and stuff like this. So once again, I think it's more about if you have a professional team who can accomplish this. This is the point. This is what I think. So are you doing any of the ortho yourself or are you working with an orthodontist? No, usually I recommend my patients to visit. Uh, there is a very good uh, orthodontist. He's working in Portugal. Nuno, Nuno Souza, if you know. Yes, you know I do. Him? He's right there. Every, yes. Thank you so much. A very I'm handsome very devil. To be here with one of the most famous dentists in the world, our friend Dr. Nazari. Nice, nice to see you. Here nice to you. to share the podium with you. Yeah. Come on. Come and good. Oh my gosh. I have to say that these are the most famous in the world. Well, here, here, come on. Come on, Ryan, can you pan us all in? Here, you guys come here and sit down. They are the most famous. Well, you know what? The most skillful. You know what? Sit down because. Yeah, let me sit close to. We're all on. Um, we're all on the same um, subject. I mean, we're all on cosmetic dentistry. You are a cosmetic dentist. You are a cosmetic dentist. You are an orthodontist. Um, I. We have Dr. Pelecanos here on the. Dr. Pelecanos, we are waiting for you. We are here <laughs> in the So we have a podcast inside of the podcast. Exactly. It's a, du it's a double podcast here. So Who is it? Double is it? podcast. So we have a new plantologist and. Uh, wait, wait, excuse me. What the, what is that? Hello. I was saying that I was very proud to be sharing the podium with this amazing dentist, world famous Dr. Pelecanos, Dr. Dr. Uh, Nazari Mikhail <laughs> <laughs> And it's a great pleasure for me to be here and 
I will give the word to Dr. Nazari. Well, you, you moderate this. This is your podcast. Moderate because you're talking to an orthodontist. You're talking to a cosmetic dentist legend in South Africa. And tell them who you are. Uh, actually, I'm Stavros Pelikanos. I'm coming from Athens, Greece. I am a prosthodontist and uh, I'm doing uh, also some uh, uh, surgery. So that's me. <laughs> Well, what, well t- t- you lead the discussion. What, what's hot and what's not in cosmetic dentistry? And what, what's hot? What's hot well, what's and what's hot? not well, in cosmetic dentistry? I can say for sure that the guys who are sitting here are very hot. I mean, like, <laughs> in the cosmetic dentistry, excuse me, please understand me in a proper way. <laughs> I, 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 I'll tell you. I'll, I'll sort of come in there. I'm going to give you the mic. Yes. I'm going to give him some credit because I think these days, the the really the the hot thing in cosmetic dentistry is orthodontics. It's really wow, becoming so much. it's yeah. becoming the most important tool that we have to make the biggest difference in in really achieving the the best results. Well, I would not say that we are the most important ones because <laughs> even if I place the teeth in the right position, you guys need to come and to make things look nice because many times the teeth they don't look nice from the beginning and you are the ones that make the patient feel really happy in a short time. Yeah, but... but right you, math. <laughs> Confirmative. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, you know what? We have a discussion about uh, the cost of patients for biology and for how much it costs to fix the, the teeth. And the cost to the biology is the most important thing that we have to tackle. And, and so the orthodontists well, make that the, 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 the easiest uh, for us to fix. Well... Us being the two old guys, <laughs> I, I have to tell you. Three. Well, how old, are, how old are you? How old are you? Forty-nine. Oh, you're still not even fifty. So go, go home. You're you're still a baby. You're not even fifty. But I I have, I have to tell you this. When we were little, he's true. There was an orthodontic involvement, and when someone had crowded teeth, they'd file them half down and do all these veneers. They'd remove so much tooth structure. And ten years later, when they did those upper ten veneers, ten years later, what percent of those teeth needed a root canal? Uh, 20%? Yeah, 20%. I mean, when your only tool's a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and they would just drill down all these teeth, and you used to look at these cases, and you're like, wow, it was a pretty girl. She just had some crowding, and now you've, like, filed down 10 teeth for a crown, and it looks like she has 10 little rice pegs on her teeth, and then they cement these PFMs, and I'd really cringe. It's like you just kind of orally abused her, and it was just... It was kind of gross. And now I would say that 30 years later, your generation is doing it so much more minimally invasive. Would you, do you agree? Well, yes, you know, we are analyzing different things. I mean, we are starting from your generation, but we are also studying your pluses and maybe we are also studying on your mistakes. So this is also a big thank you for you because we don't have to do the same mistakes again when we are doing this. And uh, of course, like knowing how to move teeth and also knowing how to work with the magnification. We can have the very thin veneers, like 0.1, 0.3 millimeters, and have already a static and functional upgrade. And uh, understanding that even with the approach that you had, you were successful. If we change the approach to the one that we're using nowadays, so probably it's gonna be even more successful than it was in the past. So I think we're going the proper direction, you know, this is the point. Okay, I, I got it, I got it. My job is to guess what they're thinking, and those hundred, the 150,000 Americans you're talking to, it's about 8,000, but probably 83% are Americans. When you say 0.1 and 0.3, they believe that if you don't have a millimeter and a half reduction, it's all going to break. So when you say 0.1 or 0.3, half the audience just said, are you crazy? Those will break. How would you address that? No, I've been to the doctor. I'm fine. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And actually, uh, when people think that the veneer 0.1, 0.2 millimeters are going to break, those are mostly like, uh, that's like mostly classical approach in prosthodontics. Those are people who were mostly using in the past, like not bonding, but cementation. And I also understand them because if I was doing the same stuff for so many years, I would probably think the same way. But nowadays we all are using adhesion. And if we are clear with the protocol using isolation and all the other proper steps, we see that the final outcomes are really good. I mean, of course, you can break that kind of veneer when you're holding your hands, but if you bond it properly in the patient's mouth, then it's working perfectly. So don't be afraid 
believe me, we've done many cases, not just me, but many professionals in the world, and the results are great. Just follow the protocol and you'll be successful. So I, I want to ask a question, and I want you to all go around and answer it. Um, if I analyze the four million posts on Dental Town, a lot of things everyone agrees with. Some things are extremely controversial. I would say the most extremely controversial thing in Dental Town is actually occlusion. And it's almost like religion. It's either like you're Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or Christian. There's neurological um, occlusion. There's neuromuscular, I mean, neuromuscular occlusion. There's all these different occlusions. Um, what is your thoughts? Some people say, Dude, occlusion doesn't even matter because when they eat, their teeth never even touch. So what would you tell these young dentists who are coming out of school? Because most of what you're talking to is under 30. Probably 20% of those people on the camera are in dental school and the other 80% are probably within five years out. And they're seeing all these marketing for neuromuscular, CR, all these different occlusions. How would you define occlusion and what camp should they go learn if there's all these different camps? <laughs> well, uh, as an orthodontist and the way I was trained, I can tell you that I can say that I know nothing about occlusion and no one knows nothing about occlusion. You need to have knowledge in the medical field more than in the dental field. And if I can give any advice to the people that are just graduating, as you, as you said, uh, is a field that needs to be explored. Uh, we know few things about it, but we are not sure about them. You agree with me, Naz? No. Yes, you, yes. So a lot of things, um, I think with uh, more knowledge, uh, we will have better answers for this. Uh, many people, they, uh, they believe in some things they are really with very dogmatic. I don't think we have at the moment a right answer. So this is what I can say about occlusion. Uh, Do you have uh, something well, to add? Well, I can just say that you, you were saying a, about which club they should join. I mean, if there are some nice like, girls, I mean, they can join my club. And, <laughs> uh, and, and the continue with the occlusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, they're like different schools, like neuromuscular approach, like Slavic school or like CR position from Peter Dawson. Uh, personally, me, I'm speaking just about myself as a clinician, not a scientist. I'm using the CR position and I'm doing quite a lot full mouth reconstructions. And for me, it works good because it's repeatable. I mean, it's not some kind of information that you are talking about from the podium, like trying to pretend like a smart guy or something. But this is the stuff that you can go home and you can repeat with your patients. But, but you should give to the, the, the audience a definition of uh, centric uh, relation because, as you know, we have more than 11 definitions, different definitions about this. So it's start, the problem starts there. Many people come with different definitions, with different approaches, with different blah, 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 and we don't have a good answer. Yeah, so just not to get them more con lot confused, I would just recommend them to read the book from the Peter Dawson. I mean, this is the one that I believe in. This is the way to be What's the name of the book? Let, let the prosthodontist talk, Dr. Pelecanos, to, to bring something. Actually, uh, I think we have w two schools. Usually when we are going to meetings, we have the American school uh, going uh, almost always every case in CR. And we have the European school, which actually they don't care too much. They uh, erase the vertical dimension uh, <coughs> also in the uh, maximal intercuspation. Uh, actually, for me, I, I, I agree with uh, Nazari that uh, uh, erasing uh, the vertical dimension is a way to be more conservative, because then you don't have to prep the teeth too much. So for me, this is a very important tool, especially for people that they are braxists or for bulimic pe uh, people that have abrasions in their teeth. I always go for um, vertical dimension, a raise of the vertical dimension in CR. And tomorrow I will al also show in my presentation some uh, ways to do it. And so uh, it's very repeatable. Uh, once you, have, you need some experience to do it per hand, manually ma manipulation, but yeah. Uh, using the anterior deprogramming, the programmer, it's very, very important. So this, I will, I will show you tomorrow some uh, 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 how to do it in my Just presentation. The, short way. the <laughs> fact that it's repeatable, does it mean that it's the correct way? You're actually, what it's, you are looking at is not, uh, it's not the repeatability, it's the comfort zone of the patient. So yes, this comfort zone. You trust the patient opinion or is something that is measurable? Because if you tell me, I place 
um, some device that actually is measuring the activity of the muscles and I see if I place the mandible in this position, it's in balance, is repeatable, but is in balance. And this is what we called normal. I agree. But with but what we do in 2016, we really use, I mean, we don't really use anything with precision to come to this conclusion. But we don't say, do you have pain? No. Do you have clicks? No. Well, how many diseases do you know that there is no pain and this patient is almost dying? A cancer. Do you have pain? No. Is it normal? No. It's sick. So we believe that pain, clicks, and I think we are very much below you can the, the you right cannot, answers. No, no, you cannot measure it. Uh, but we you, you, have a, you have a, a very good tool in your armamentarium. That's provisionalization. And with your provisionals, you can check it. What? what, what yes, uh, can this I is just something say, that... It's just one thing. Yeah. How can I do this with orthodontics? Yeah. I told you, yeah. you see, there is a big problem with orthodontics. <laughs> there is no provision? Yeah, yeah but, but also, you know, as we move more into the minimally invasive type dentistry, the provisionalization becomes more of a problem. So no. it becomes really difficult. Uh, we um, do bonded yeah. transitional restorations in our practice to, to work out the occlusion and see how it's going to work. <laughs> but I have to say, in my opinion, okay, that I'm on both camps, that I think that actually the CR or maximal intercuspation, it's really both of them are working for patients. I can't honestly tell the difference in, 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 in these groups over the years that I've treated. But one, but one thing that I would say, the one thing that I would say, that when we do all our full mouth rehabilitations, we give very, very good anterior guidance that's very gentle for the patient, that they can manage smooth transitions. And, and then, for sure, I tell them, that if you can destroy your teeth, you can destroy my dentistry. So you have to wear a night guard. Absolutely. I agree with like you. And one more comment. Yeah. You know, no, no, also from orthodontists, that the most difficult patient we face are the class two patients. Mm. So these patients, the they, they don't have any, 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 any guidance. And uh, these are the most difficult, the the most diffi yes. Why, not so why are they the most difficult? The guidance well, is too steep. It's locked. They, ca they, they cannot move freely. They're locked in one position. Talk yeah. Talking to the mic. Yeah. So tell me. Yeah, tell they, me they're they're locked into a position. So I have a case tomorrow. I'll show that, that we have a class two. It's, it's a class two. And it's a very deep. We do orthodontics for all these patients. We don't treat these wear cases until we move the teeth into a more manageable position from a, an occlusal point of view. <coughs> Totally agree. I try to, to reduce the vertical uh, overbite and I, wa I try to reduce the overset. Once you go for full mouth rehabilitation, because this patient in class two, they can work uh, once they have their own teeth. But once you go for prosthetics, then it becomes uh, because critical. Because the muscles are very strong with these patients and they break what you do. Yeah, and yeah, that, that's actually too bad that you were not on my lecture in the morning because we, I was, <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because actually my lecture was about the CR. Two hours, I was I showing four full mouth reconstructions. I will, I will do the same. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, but, but, yeah, so, but we didn't have place in the room because the room was full. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. And uh, the, the point is, the point is, I mean, I'm always recommending to use the CR in two cases. When I have a full mouth reconstruction, or when I'm using with the full, when I'm working with the full arch, so when you can give your patient not only nice tooth structure, but you can give him a health, you can give him relaxed muscles plus a nice tooth structure in the end. This is the point. And uh, I'm also I had I was showing the case today when the patient came with the full mouth reconstruction already done three years ago, and um, yeah, she has also like some kind of MIP that was created for her. And uh, if I will just follow this MIP approach, then what I'm supposed to do, just remove these restorations, put new ones, and that's it. A lot of those people don't know what MIP means. Maximum intercuspidation. Like, uh, intercuspidation boy. or cuspation or whatever, right. this doesn't matter. Yeah, what wait, is important? Wait, wait, wait a second, wait, let, me, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish, one second. So the point is, if the patient like this comes to my office and the patient is ready to finance the treatment, and if I'm just gonna remove all the old restorations and put in the place the new ones with the same bite, this is not a treatment. It's called aesthetic upgrade. Because 
the patient still will have the lateral pterygoid muscle that is tense all the time working, temporalis, the masseter, and all this stuff going on. What I want to do, I want to relax the muscles to create the comfort was Star was talking about. And then fix it with the beautiful restorations. So this patient who came already with the full mouth reconstruction, when I deprogrammed her, I've got a gap about three and a half, four millimeters on the front. So, so if, me, if me as a doctor, if I'm gonna fix the position how she came, this is not a treatment. This is earning money. You know, this is the point. This is what I, how I think. I would like to hear Nuno because we have uh, many problems, at least in Greece, yeah. uh, we have a lot of problems with the orthodontists. And when they are finishing cases, really the occlusion uh, does not look good. Yeah. So I well, want well, to hear it's, your it's, opinion it's about it. I can... Uh, okay. Explain it's, what you mean by the occlusion doesn't look good. Uh, we see... Is it because they blow out they blow out their curva speed, the curva Wilson, or they're not closing the teeth? Explain what you mean by you don't like the occlusion. Actually, there is no uh, maximum intercuspation. We have some contacts in molars, uh, maybe second premolar, and then there is a gap between the teeth when the patients are biting. So, do you really uh, consider about finalizing in details the occlusion after the? finalization well. of the treatment <laughs> <laughs> again this comes uh, a very uh, delicate subject but that is uh, sorry the, no it's delicate because again me as orthodontist and the orthodontist they are dentists as you showed me in that picture the dentists are not orthodontist what do I mean with this is that I understand when you with pros work go in precision as Nazari was mentioning doing preparations of 0 0.1, but we, as orthodontists, we work with biology, and a lot of skills are required, even if now we have short smile and all the systems to finish the things perfect, we will never to be able to finish an ortho case as you do a pros case. This is, I mean, in 2016, even if he's a top, uh, you know, Japanese orthodontist that is <laughs> the canon of orthodontists, you know, it's really difficult. And you as prosthodontist need to understand that there is a, our limit. This is our limitation. No okay, sure. Yeah, but for example, if we just really uh, want to ask you, what do you think about it? For example, if I have a patient who came to my office and needs ortho, and if I start the treatment from deprogramming, I do the registrations, I send it to the lab. In the lab, with the CR position, we actually create centric occlusion for the patient. We make a setup of the teeth. I mean, can you as an orthodontist create this for me. So if I make a setup for you and I say, no, no, I want the teeth to be like this. Can you do it in the patient's mouth? Because well, why I'm asking, so because... I, I understand as what you mean, and I, the, 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 the right answer for this is that in some patients I will be able to do it because I will be lucky. In some patients, no. It will be dependent on my skills. It will be dependent on patient biology because maybe, let's say in a, a very simple example, we are closing spaces. Same patient, same mechanics, same amount of force. In one side, closes faster than the other. So we have to understand, we have this limitation. In some, time, in some cases, we will finish perfect. And we will take these cases to the meeting and we show, wow, this is top orthodontist. <laughs> but it's not like this, not like you. You can do the same pros work and you'll get the point of perfection of skills. Uh, you will get the skills and the, the training and the learning curve and you will get to a point, almost no failure. With us, it's not like this. Can this I interfere? Is my feeling. Uh, no, yes, no, I sure. was amazed now by Nazari because how many dentists really do the setup? I mean, sure, yeah. Can if you, you do this setup, is like the same. Yes, I mean, the I mean, I mean, the setup is done usually by the by the technicians, and this is not the correct yes. thing to do. My the dentist should do, which means you have to cut the tooth in the right, you know, position, and then you have to transfer the tooth in the correct position. The way I work and the way we, I was showing today, if we do digital setup that is quite easier comparing to the old way, we can easily communicate between the team and find a reasonable or several reasonable treatment goals. We can move the teeth <coughs> digitally, we can discuss with the team, well, the prosthodontist asked me, as you said, can you move this tooth this, to this position? And me as orthodontist, I have to be careful with the answer. I have to say, is it possible? Yes. Are you able to do it? 
I will do everything on my power to do it. Sometimes we will not achieve this for many reasons. But the way to communicate is, as Tabro said, doing a setup and using this to communicate between the team. Yes. I don't think a lot of Americans know what you mean by a setup. The, the a setup is having the initial malocclusion and digitally we can extract it, we can move this, rotate them in order to have an idea of what the final result will look like, right? Okay. This is what prosthodontists they do. This is what part of the DSD show the emotional dentistry means. It should so, be done by the restorative dentist. I mean, this is the guy responsible for this well as christian not said by, it should be done by the, the smile designer because yes. you as a prosthodontist you do some setup when you move one molar 10 millimeters and as an orthodontist i tell you no i cannot do that so it should be done by the team it's difficult but the team should be together to do this and to discuss about this and to write down treatment goals and treatment plan okay. this is what i call the excellence in dentistry is having a patient with one, two, three, four doctors with different specialties and discuss and finding a conclusion in spot. So is it difficult? Yes. Is it expensive? Yes. Are we doing this? Probably not everyone. And this is what makes people different one from each other. But in my opinion, this is the, the excellence in dentistry. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. You, know, you, were, you were talking so nice that I wanted to write down, but I didn't have a pen. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I good. I have it in the eye watch, so it's the recording, watch, recording everything. Yeah. So what I want to say that what I also noticed that's why I was asking you those questions about the CR position, that most of the patients who had the ortho treatment, if we deprogram them, I mean, which at least we deprogram as much as we can. I mean, this is what I mean. Uh, most of them will have a super contact distally. I mean, that's why I was asking you, like, I, I, was re I would really would like to cooperate with the orthodontist. But who I can? Mean, why you, you think that deprogramming the patient is bringing the patient to the normality? Because, why, why because, because, because normality, you, 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 do, you do, you know, like do you know what is normality? Well, normality, yeah. You tell me like this, this patient, when it's not deprogrammed, it's not in balance. And so the daily, the, the situation as it is usually, is wrong and now I'm deprogramming the patient and now he's in balance. The muscles are relaxed. Now this is the rest position. Why, where, where do you measure this? You ask the patient, do you feel better now? Yes, now I feel good. Do, wh wh where is this? If you measure this, show me and I agree. Well, but if you don't measure this, I still believe that we are not machines, there is a range. And the answer is probably in between. Look, I can, I can, give, you, I can give you a comparison, like ergonomics and dentistry. Like, if I'm a dentist who is not using magnification, no, look no, at no. You, are, you are a robot. You no, no, like I'll this. give you a parallel. You like yes. <laughs> so when you're, around, when you're working like this and your muscle it is always tense, yes. of course, in the end of the day, you're not feeling comfortable. Sure. The same story is about your muscles in your face. <laughs> if your muscles, muscles are all the time tense because they are supposed to hold the mandibula in some specific position because of the super contact distally, it means that your muscles are always tense. You know when those people are more, most comfortable? When they wake up in the morning. Why? Because in the morning they're not biting, they don't have a bite. They have a real relaxation of the muscles. I know because I'm one of them, one of those but patients. I, I have patients that are the opposite. They, when they wake up, they have pain. Yeah, those are people who have a bruxist. This, this is, yeah, we have two groups. We have to we clearly understand who is. No, 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 wait, wait. No, no, we, wait, wait, wait a second. There is information. There are clenches. There are bruxes. The clenches are people who are parafunctional during the day, like me, for example. And bruxes are parafunctional during the night. So for me, uh, I'm uh, really... Uh, this is what comes in the books, but if you think properly, no. <laughs> you can say that there are people that are bruxisms? Bruxists? What, what, what is this exactly? Why so, we are doing this parafunction? Uh, no, no. There you is know. another reason. We, we, we say that when we don't know what it is, No, no. Stress. I think Nazar is making a point. <clears throat> you don't have to make every patient in this CR. I mean... Only if, but if you are doing a case where you are doing the full maxilla or the full mandible or upper and lower together, then it's more safe to go in the CR position. I think this is yeah, we are, a we're, point. We're not speaking about each tooth doing in the CR position or something. Yes, yes just exactly, like, exactly. Point. So don't misunderstand uh, Nazari. So I'm thinking about full mouth cases and I'm talking about uh, res restoring upper or lower or both. So you agree about this? 
Well, I agree. I, if you tell me as a prostodontist that this is uh, what we do and it works well, I, I cannot say that it, yes. it, it's not like this. Because the only thing I'm saying is that I don't have a right answer for this. And we are here in this discussion to try to my, uh, brainstorm this issue mm -hmm. in order to get to some conclusion. Yeah. And I tell you my issues. Do I understand about TMJ in order to discuss this properly? Probably not. Not me and not 99% of the orthodontists. Is this the reason that they don't finish the cases as you are complaining? No. The issue is some of them they are not skilled enough. Some of them they don't care enough. Some of them they are not just not lucky enough because the patient is it's not the, this patient that we might achieve this. It's complicated. It's not like m mechanics. It's not like yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, mathematics. It's really complicated. Yeah, listen, I, I agree with you, and I'll, I'll throw a spanner in the whole works, because <laughs> what, what about, like, for instance, and, and that's not my preference anymore, I have to say, but there's a lot of times still where, where, where these wear cases are being treated with the dial appliance, where we're just opening the bite in the anterior and leaving the occlusion. And so we're talking about now orthodontics having to finish everything in beautiful occlusion, and now as prosthodontists, we're just taking something and actually doing the opposite as a, as, as a form of treatment. So how does this... Wait, 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 wait. Explain me exactly what you are saying. Let's say I'm that I finish that a the, case... That if you that have the no bite space in the front, they're making uh, an, o an open bite in the posterior. They're creating the open bite. And so... Because, now, because they don't have any space to restore the anterior teeth. So it's really an interesting concept that for one part of it, we say we have to finish with this occlusion and now there's another prosthodontic process which says that we must now open the occlusion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Look, what, I, what I would like to say... The problem is, the problem is that quite often surgeons decide by themselves what they have to do. Orthodontists, they have to decide by themselves what to do. Some other guy, dental technicians are also supposed to decide by themselves how to accept. And I think the guy who is the most responsible is the doctor who accepts the patient the first time. I mean, the restorative guy. Because he's supposed to give you the goal, what to do. You're not supposed to figure out what to do. I'm supposed to call you and say, look, Nuno, I would like the teeth in this position. Because I'm the guy who is treating and who is going to finalize the case. The same story I was supposed to call the dental technician or the surgeon and tell them what I want from you as a specialist. This is the point. So then when you have a goal, then you... I don't agree, and let, let me yeah. give you the, my, my opinion. Approach. No, no, this is a team approach. No, this is a prosthodontist approach. Yeah, the team approach is that, in my opinion, some cases should be guided by the pros, some cases should be guided by the ortho. Thank you. So there is no right answer. So the idea is each case should be looked together can i just say that the case That's should it. be driven by the face not by you or and by who you. knows about face but it's the orthodontist i, I, I know i don't th i think we all know about the face we know that each case must no. be driven by the face well and by this function. is theoretical but when i tell you and you tell me okay we have this 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 proclination and i want to push this this back and nazario is a prosthodontist he is doing um a, a, a setup and they they he's changing the, the position of this, and he tells me, no, no, put the teeth in this place. D does he know what will happen to the lip? Of course, that, that, well, but, that's, that's, no. that, yes. but that's why it's a fa right? that's why it's a So this is my question, who knows about this? Who but knows what will happen to the I'm patient in 30 years in terms of growth? But it's a facially driven who knows plan. A, who knows about growth and development? We, we all have to make those decisions. It should be all the team together. Of course, but it's the face that drives the treatment. But the idea that the orthodontist is looking to the plaster models and just wants class one, uh, this is finished. finished. We look to the face before any other specialist. I want to ask uh, Stavros one question. Yeah. Stavros, imagine we have a patient and the patient comes for ortho. The patient is 20 years old. Nuno does ortho in MIP, not CR. When, the difference. Yeah, the centriculation is the definition that explains the position of the condyle, and MIP is maximum intercuspidation. It's a definition that explains the contacts on the teeth. And um, sometimes they don't match. I mean, when they match, it's called centric occlusion. So when 
the patient is 60 years old, he comes again to the office after 40 years, and we see that the patient has lots of erosions, and the patient needs a full mouth reconstruction. What do we do? We definitely go to the CR, centric relation. But you no. see a big difference between the CR and the maximum interocus patient. There Let's is. say that the mandible goes back four millimeters, five millimeters. What do you do as a prosthodontist? It's a surgical case now because maybe the mandible was short compared to the maxilla. And no. you didn't check this in before. The patient had a phantom bite. He was biting like this. They call the Sunday bite because they bite like this. They don't want to look convex profile. They look into the mirror and they get used to bite but like this. Anyway, when you, have, go this way? when you it's have complex. to go to the CR, you have to, go to do a full mouth. You have to go to the CR. How, yeah, how can you do it? That's okay, no, but no. the patient, imagine, we have these patients that they have a class two skeletal, skeletal relationship and they have a big overjet and we call the Sunday bite. They, used to get, they get used to a position of the mandible in order to look more in balance. So they bite a little bit forward. And after 60 years, you take the patient, you check CR, the mandible goes back. It's a surgical case, but you say, no, I will do pros, and I will do the reconstruction in this position. So how do you... Right now, you're looking for some exclusive cases. Yes, exactly. Exclusive. <laughs> we are talking about class 2 skeletal relationship that is probably more than half of the patients. Okay, but like, I wouldn't say that we have like in every single patient so many problems that you're describing right now. Like, believe me, you know I'm so relaxed right now because, the, because I know what I'm doing clinically works 100% and it's repeatable. And also it's evidence-based proven. And uh, I will tell you that if I would treat myself and I need a treatment because I'm parafunctional, so I would go with this approach because one more time it's repeatable and I can teach anyone to do this. And we don't have to guess. And I, gave, I think I gave quite nice examples. So when the person comes, when being 20 years old, and you do ortho, like in MIP position, not the CR, and then in, in years, the person needs a full mouth reconstruction, and we see that the position is not right. I mean, then you know what I have to do then next? I have to send the patient again to Nuno to do ortho one more time, but already to the CR position and then to the it, prosthetics. This is the point. Let me tell you something. Many, many orthodontists, we have two, let's say, philosophies. Some orthodontists that they treat only after mounting the case in the articulator and the orthodontist, they don't care at all. This is what the reality is, okay? The way I was trained, I was not trained checking the, the, with the articulator, okay? And I was all, ask, all the time asking why this, and I realized that the explanation was that, you know, as soon as you place brackets and you start with tooth movement, patients start to have premature contacts everywhere. So you don't have a stable occlusion. So why not considering that the mandible, as soon as there is no occlusion that is wrong, as you say, from the beginning, why the mandible doesn't go to the relaxed position? That is the same as having a splint, right? So why the mandible stays there? Because I'm, I'm question. I'm not saying that this is, should be like this or that. It's I'm still young. I don't know a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Tell me this. Explain yeah, me. Because once you have, uh, today I was showing a case, the, the woman, who had the full arch uppers and she had only one canine on the lowers. The canine was actually the, program, uh, the problem why she was programmed. Because of having that contact, she was always finding where to put the tooth to the uppers. That's why the muscles were <coughs> always programmed. Once I extract the tooth, that's it. I let her be so like this without any contact for a while and she's gained it's the like program. The tooth. We change position. So why not, why don't you believe that the mandible adapts to the what you called the relaxed That's muscle right. position. Uh, Why not? Uh, well, ask again, please. Can you repeat again? You put brackets on the patient, yeah. right? Sure. The patient is in maximum intercuspidation. You put brackets. After a few hours, the teeth start to move. Mm -hmm. And in a week, the patient starts to feel just contact in one side. After two weeks, just contact in the other. Mm -hmm. So there is no stable position. It, it makes sense that the jaw and the muscles that they don't find the right and the part of, uh, how do you say, a, a wrong uh, uh, initials, they, they should, it should go to no. the right, to the, the resting position, no? No, I'll give you an explanation. Uh, <laughs> uh, because actually, how do we lose the CR? There is very easy explanation how, like, for example, there is a patient with a beautiful bite, you do very small restoration, 
and the restoration is in a super occlusion. So as a result, the information, because of the periapical tissues about the overload, goes to the brain, and the brain is telling, hey, dude, para lateral pterygoid muscle, move the mandibula to another position because otherwise we will destroy the tooth. So this is what's happening sure. in your case when you're saying you're putting brackets. So when the person starts closing and feel, feels somewhere the supra contacts, the pair of tissues are sending information to the brain and the brain is out really quickly analyzing the case and is saying to the muscles, guys, move the mandibula to the way so you run away from the supra contact. Then another one appears and it moves again, it moves again. So the muscles are programmed even more because now they have to work a lot not to destroy the teeth and the new supra contacts. This is the point, am I right? It makes sense, well, but uh, I'm not sure if he's like this. I don't agree. I, have to, I don't agree with that, I have to say, because, I mean, I do a lot of orthodontics as well, and, and we create these, these, these issues that you're exactly talking about. And, and to date, I have to say, I've never had one patient come back and say, I've now developed some muscle spasm or some muscle pain because now you've created... Uh, a premature contact. I mean, we do this all the time. We create premature contacts. And, but they, they have, I've never had a patient that's actually complained suddenly during the, the, the orthodontics has created muscle spasm. They're not supposed to complain because nine people out of ten don't have a CR position and don't complain. Like in this room, only one person has the CR. In, when, if, if it's lucky, that's, that's, the, that's the point. So when, even if there, there is no the CR position, it doesn't mean that the person is going to complain because we are lucky as a dentist because quite often we have quite a big range of adaptation of the patient. So this is why many people are sitting in the room, for example, during lectures, and they're thinking, okay, the guy is speaking about the CR, but I've done many cases and, and my patients are still alive. Nobody died, right? I mean, yeah, because why? Because we are lucky. Because, but the point is that some patients have the adaptation zone like this, we are supposed to measure to get somewhere here, 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 doesn't matter where, but somewhere in between the borders. But some people have adaptation zone like this. And this is when we might have trouble if we don't work with the CR position. Do, do you not think that those are the patients that have a psychogenic problem? No, those are not because there is, lo there is lots of evidence-based literature and information yeah. proven. For, this for, is sure, the point. for sure, even, I mean, Frank Spear documents that well about the psychogenic element to parafunction. It's, well, it's, you know, well, now you speak about, yeah, the reasons for the, for the parafunction is about 70% are, are the mo emotional reasons. Yeah. So that's why... This I also don't... I know uh, no, this are. This is also when, proven when because... Proven is very relative. When, I believe when we don't know exactly the reason, we say that it's like a stress. In my opinion, many things that we don't know how to explain or we say that it's autoimmune disease or we say that... We, the patient has stress, and stress is uh, when we don't know how to treat. It's for many things. Uh, in my opinion, is what we are uh, blaming. There are many cases w that you finalize, and there is no parafunction of the full mouth after full mouth reconstruction. But after a year, the patient can get divorced, or something. Th something can happen in the family or there is stress during the work, and believe me, many of those people start clenching. And clenching is a direct result of the emotional stress of the person. This is 100%, not even discussing. Well, this is the point. Uh, we cannot say 100%. <laughs> 99, so 99, let's say. Please tell 99. Uh, tell Sorry, 99 just for Nuno. I'm mean. giving you this because I, I don't really believe in this. Yeah, no, I, sir, I'm uh, not saying that there is not related, it's multifactorial for sure. But our ignorance, makes us to lay stress more than it should. But yeah, believe because me, no, no, believe me, I would like it not to be true because this is the fact that I cannot influence. If it was a dental reason, <coughs> it would be more easy for me because learning some new material, I would learn how to fix it. But I cannot influence the emotional position of the patient. Even though if I do a perfect dentistry, he's still being emotional can destroy it after a few years. This is the I want to patient half an hour more and talk about his wanna, life and I only, talk, got, yes. I only got five more minutes, so I, I want to ask a yes. very important yes. question. Um, we get um, a lot of emails, a lot of questions we watch on downtown. So a lot of these people, probably twenty percent, are juniors and seniors in dental school. Probably four or five thousand of them are just been out in five years. They they got all these things to learn. And on top of the 
confusion about occlusion. Now they're hearing all these marketing things that, hey, 100% of anybody who grinds your brooks their teeth needs to be have a sleep study. That you guys, it's not about teeth. It's not about occlusion. They're not sleeping right. They're not in REM cycle. They might need a CPAP machine. Blah, blah. So, now, so now all these people that are treating grinding, bruxism, night guards, now they're hearing in journals and conventions that it's all sleep apnea. We only got five minutes. I'm so sorry to ask you guys to sum up sleep apnea. But I want you to go around and tell these people, what are, what are your thoughts about, is this a fad? It should, should, what, what about specifically the claim that 100% of people that brux or grind their teeth at night need to have a sleep study? Well, I, I will ask uh, Stavros to, let's start this way because it's not really a subject that I dominate uh, Definitely that malocclusion is related to breathing and I will stay just here. I will not develop this subject more in terms of uh, appliances to improve breathing and for snoring and all this. I don't want to go this way. I, I don't want uh, to say uh, wrong uh, things. Listen, I, 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 I'll say one thing. I think that there's very little evidence yes. that can, can absolutely uh, link these things together. Um, and I've had patients, 100%, young patients, young teenagers, perfect occlusions, sleeping beautifully, who are bruxing their teeth. And, and so I, I think to, to really, I think, yeah, I, I think to suddenly stand up and say, oh, you, you obviously have a sleep problem and we have to now do all these sleep uh, studies. I think it's really well, a method of, I'm not sure about As a this. conclusion, I think we focus too much on heart tissue and we should study more what's going on with the muscles. Because as orthodontists, what I see is that we move teeth, we control the, the heart tissue, but we, when we fight with the soft tissue, we always lose. If we have a tongue that is pushing a tooth to one direction, we lose even if we move this very well. So soft tissues, they control and they dominate the situation. We should know more about muscles, uh, more about function, uh, but focused on the soft tissue, not on the heart tissue. This is my opinion. Actually, sleep apnea is a problem, but how much is this related to uh, parafunction or to uh, dental problems? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a cleanser, I'm a braxer. So uh, I'm brunch, uh, brunching during night, but I sleep really very good. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if there is any evidence, so I, I agree with Mark, uh, of uh, how much this uh, affects the dental, uh, uh, the, den the, the, uh, the tooth, the teeth. So, but it's a problem. It's for sure a problem. And the solution is, you know, every time we don't know how to deal with something, we make a splint. And of course, you know, the Americans are very good in uh, doing splints. And, uh, but I think uh, that this is a good solution uh, in cases you have a sleep apnea, for sure. Well, yeah. I can just you know, advise you, I'm not gonna speak about apnea because Sauer said everything. I can just advise you read proper books, visit proper courses and visit proper dentists like like Nuno, people who are emotionally living with their profession. This is very important. Not, not people who are just earning money, but people who want to understand the truth. People who understand what they know and people who understand what they still don't know. This is very important. So I wish you good luck. And anyone else something to say? I just want to say this. I want to, um, um, you guys mentioned your lectures tomorrow. Um, I would just do anything to get you guys to put a course on Dental Town. Um, we got 210,000 dentists. Um, the thing about Dental Town is they love uh, taking their courses on their iPhones or iPads. If you watch this on an iPhone, you can throw it up on your, uh, if you have um, Apple TV. So they're sitting at home, they throw it up on their big screen, they're in their favorite chair. Uh, they're, you know, it, they just love it. But um, you guys are all legends. I can't believe what an honor it is for me to be sitting here with a legend from Portugal, a legend from the Ukraine, a legend from South Africa, a legend from Greece. Um, it has just truly been an honor. And I want to go around the microphone and pass around and tell, tell 8,000 people, do you think we can ever hope to see a course online from you for on Dental Town? 
Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> well, to all of you that are watching us, I will do my best to play some of my cases or some of my results in a short presentation uh, so I, you can see what we are doing in Europe. I hope you will like it. We are still young, but we have everything well documented and uh, we are happy to show this. And is there any website they can go to to follow you or anything or... Um, well, no, it's not speak? relevant now because I will change everything now. I okay. have a website that I will change, so it's not really important. Okay. And Nas, when yes, can so, we hear your course on yes, Dental so like Already in the new season, the Smile Makeovers, lots of photos and videos. Just go to Dental Practice or Michaluk to find the details. Go to where? <laughs> that is the <laughs> is a Dental Practice of Michaluk. Well, the last name is very complicated. Just go ahead and write Microvision Group and you will find out. Right, what? Microvision group. My, micro, it. micro. M I C R O. Like me, you know, like micro, micro guy. Me, micro guy. Micro vision. Vision group. Group dot yeah. com. Yeah, just Google it. Oh, just You'll Google. Fine. Yeah. Micro vision group, and they'll find you in the Ukraine. Will, yes. Mark, when is your course going on Dental Town? Oh my God! Um, I have to say, can you see these dark rings under my eyes? <laughs> As soon as I have some sleep, I'm going to do it. But uh, for me, I'm doing all our stuff through the Implant Aesthetic Academy with uh, Howie Glackman. And uh, that's where you can see all our, our videos and all our presentations. IAA.co.za. Uh, I okay. And how about you from Greece? So I'm happy to share with you uh, some cases as well. And we are organizing also in Athens, in Greece, some courses starting uh, September. Uh, in uh, you can find some information in uh, the uh, Pelican at otenet.gr. All right, now can Greggy get a picture of us?